Hey, welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Parker Merritt of Coinmetrics to go through Q1 Bitcoin mining numbers. This is honestly one of my favorite content portions of the show that we do every quarter. We bring on Parker, discuss uh, different metrics in the Bitcoin mining game that should matter to Bitcoin miners. So whether you're a retail investment holder of a different pubco or you're a Bitcoin miner itself, these are numbers and metrics you should know if you care about the Bitcoin mining network. Thank you to Parker Merritt and Coinmetrics for joining the show. You can find everything to do with the show in the show notes per normal. Before we get into the show, we want to thank Foreman Mining, Master Your Mining, and CleanSpark, America's Bitcoin miner, for being sponsors of the show. You'll hear a little bit more from each of these sponsors during the episode. Okay, we're only about a week away from the Bitcoin happening on April 20th. So if you want to enjoy the happening event with other Bitcoiners, then you need to come to the Independence Institute on April 20th from 2 to 8 p.m. We're going to have a live event there. We're going to do film screenings, different conversations with Bitcoiners, brews and food. You can find out more information about the Bitcoin happening party here in Denver, Colorado, April 20th at the Independence Institute. Okay, last little bit for you guys. That is the Big Empty. Our new film documentary did come out just about two weeks ago at this point. Go check out the Big Empty. You can find a link in today's show notes. We'll also be doing some live screenings at a few locations soon to be announced. This is a great introduction for someone who doesn't know much about Bitcoin mining. So send it to a friend or a family member. If you enjoyed it, can you let me know? send a message to hello at blockspace.media. Okay, a few words from our sponsors and then on to the show. Hey listeners, let's talk about revolutionizing your mining operation with Foreman. This isn't your average management tool. It's an all-in-one solution for reducing costs and significantly boosting your revenue. Foreman brings a cutting edge dashboard to your fingertips, empowering you with automated energy strategies. This means not only curtailing around real-time prices, but also strategically enhancing your profit margins through demand response. It's about leveraging energy efficiency to its fullest potential. With Foreman, you get a system that scales with your business, inventory management for assets, infrastructure integration, and business intelligence. Foreman elevates the cash flow and production of your entire operation. To see how Foreman can redefine your mining operation standards, visit foreman.mn. With Foreman, you're not just managing a mining operation, you're setting a new standard in the industry. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to The Mining Pod. We're joined once again by Parker Merritt of Coinmetrics and Charlie Spears of Blockspace. Welcome both to the show, gents. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Good to be here. Charlie is in an idealistic place, the rolling hills of Oklahoma. Parker, somewhere East Coast, Georgia, something like that, right? Pretty good spot, too. Mm -hmm. And Will's in the teeming metropolis of Denver, Colorado. And yeah, I mean, it's nice out. It's springtime, happenings in the air, and we're going to talk about some Bitcoin mining data. Uh, so we always bring Parker on to talk about data. I think the last one we did was the end of this, end of last year, end of 2023. Uh, and then we took somewhat of a hiatus a little bit last year, which we're not going to do this year. We're going to be more consistent. That's right. So we can jump right into it. If you're listening to this show, I would encourage you to try to find a way to watch it. So it'll be on YouTube and Coindust TV. Uh, so you can go and pull that up. Uh, but if you're listening, we'll do our best to describe the charts that Parker is going to show to us. And then we'll obviously have lots of context and conversation around them. So Parker, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Feel free to do a bio or anything else that you think is relevant. Introduce Coinmetrics, et cetera. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll start with, you know, Coinmetrics, my employer. Um, you know, the the short of it is we're essentially an institutional data provider for crypto data, um, providing everything from what's happening on the exchanges to what's happening on chain to some of the top financial institutions that are starting to delve into the crypto space. Um, my role in particular is as a solutions engineer putting together Sample demo assets, things like uh, you know Python scripts and uh, visualizations, just showing how our data can be used. But uh, kind of my side hustle here at Coinmetrics is as a research contributor on the mining side. I'm you know the the in-house mining expert, I like to say. So and out of house. That's Parker. true. Yeah, you, and you out can of see house. the 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 S seven <laughs> mounted on the wall. You know, not not too much uh, hash rate under management, but I like to tinker. So. 
Uh, I am kind of charged with putting out our quarterly mining research report, as well as a few other reports here and there, which we'll kind of discuss in more detail going forward. Um, so with that, we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Just want to call out uh, where you can find all of this research that we're about to discuss at coinmetrics.io slash tag slash mining. That's going to be our mining research repository. Again, we met uh, in December to discuss uh, some of the past pieces of content we've put out, but there are a few new reports. Uh, so I didn't encourage everybody to go to that page to check it out. Um, so with that, we can go ahead and dive into it. Uh, you know, of course, kind of top of mind for everybody right now. And the focus for the past few months has been the having. Uh, we do have an upcoming research piece focused specifically on the having coming out next Tuesday, actually. So I can't share too much of that content just yet. Stay tuned. Uh, but here we have our having dashboard. And as you can see, we're 99.3% uh, through this epoch to the, the next having, which as it stands is currently set to happen on 420. So serendipity, hopefully we can be uh, 69K on 420. So that's just uh, about nine and a half days away. So, you know, again, who knows what's going to happen? Obviously, some exciting stuff in the rune space is uh, set to go on. Expect there to be a little bit of instability, maybe some reorg events. But obviously, this is kind of the big focal point every four years for the Bitcoin space. Um, so, yeah, keen to hear your guys' thoughts on how this is going to play out. I mean, I'm just going to show the event. We're having a Denver BitDoes happening party. So I'm the mining pod is co-sponsoring that along with BitDevs. So if you're in Denver, come by. If you're listening to the show, you've probably heard me say that a lot. But I hope it does happen on 420 because otherwise, like the day the party is off by day, and that'd be a huge bummer. But, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of uh, miners, you know, on Twitter metering up and down their ASICs, trying to make sure we remain on target. So I think at this point we're we're close enough to be pretty confident it'll happen. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have to share right now uh, directly on the having. Um, first section, as usual, we like to do a, a quick recap of, you know, some of the key fundamentals. So three charts here covering, uh, number one hash rate. So, uh, you know, since our last discussion, I think hash rate was hovering right around the 500 exahash per second, uh, area that was in December. We've already grown around 19 to 20% year to date. So, you know, the deployments have not stopped. Obviously, Bitcoin prices kind of remain pretty strong year to date as well with the uh, you know introduction of the ETFs. So I think we had offered some predictions during our, our last conversation around where we might be year end. Uh, I want to say the consensus was around 700 exahash per second, but uh, we're certainly on pace to beat that. Uh, that being said, of course, the halving could have some implications for hash rate. I've seen estimates that, you know, around 20% of the hash rate could fall off the network based on older machines. And we will do a little bit more of that analysis in our upcoming halving piece. But I mean, there's plenty of contrarian views saying that hash rate isn't going to budge at all. And people are going to push through kind of anticipating that inevitable rise in Bitcoin price that happens after a halving, whether that's just narrative or whether there's actually, you know, some supply and demand effect there. Uh, who's to say? But Interesting metric, continuing to watch hash rate tick up as always. Next fundamental, of course, is uh, hash price and hash value. Um, for those not familiar, this is just revenue per terahash per second. Um, hash value kind of remains on a permanent downtrend as more miners come online to compete for a fixed share of the Bitcoin pie. Uh, we're down a, about 28% year to date uh, at 159 sats per terahash per second. Um, you know, last year there were a few. Small spikes in hash value, uh, thanks to some of the transaction fee activity that was generated by ordinals and inscriptions, uh, but continuing to tick lower. So Bitcoin just getting scarcer and scarcer, including for miners. And then hash price, as a result of Bitcoin's booming price, is up 17% year to date, 11 cents per terahash per second. So um, pretty healthy levels, you know, back to where we were sitting towards mid 2022. Um, so, you know, this is definitely giving miners a little bit of cushion going to the having. Obviously, we're going to see this drop a bit, uh, as the having cuts revenue in half. But, uh, hopefully, you know, Bitcoin price doubles and we continue to see hash price, uh, trend upwards over the long term. I want to pause here for a second and just, I don't know, gaze in awe at how strong this chart is going down to the right. And that's, 
you know, hash value just keeps going down. And I wonder from like a Wall Street analyst perspective, you basically should be looking at this chart, right? And look at it and be like, dang, this keeps going down to the right. Do you think this ever like sinks into Wall Street or traditional money that this is something that will continue going down? Revenue will keep going down? Because I, I think that a lot of people are still pumping money into mining stocks. People are more interested than ever. Uh, yet this chart is still pointing in the same direction. Yeah, I think it it kind of depends on how these publicly traded miners sell themselves. You know, historically, a lot of them have been like, look, we have a big old Bitcoin bag. We're cash flowing and adding Bitcoin to our treasury. Um, but that's going to be a harder and harder story to sell with less and less Bitcoin rewards coming in. Right. So I think you're going to have to see some of these miners pivot from, you know, being simple investment vehicles offering exposure to Bitcoin, especially now that they have the competition of ETFs and, of course, uh, Michael Saylor just levering up as hard as he can. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more rebranding of mining companies, you know, as technology providers, you know, energy producers. Uh, you're starting to see a lot of people talk about AI as well, maybe just a buzzword. Uh, but I think that is the major implication here is that, you know, simply owning and generating Bitcoin revenue is not going to be enough, um, especially post having. Yeah, that's a riff on this for too long, but it is fascinating to look at a data chart like this showing decreasing revenue over the long term and then look at headlines of how miners are pivoting and trying to accumulate more revenue. Just funny to put those two things next to each other, but I won't dwell on that much longer. Go on to the next chart. Yeah, I mean, the the one consideration you have to keep in mind with a metric like hash price is it's denominated in terahash per second which miners are increasingly upgrading their fleets and buying machines that have more terahash per second, you know, output efficiency. So, you know, we might have to kind of toggle the way we look at hash price, you know, going from terahash per second to pay to hash per second or some other measure, uh, because, you know, increasingly terahash per second, just like gigahash per second became an outdated way of looking at miners, uh, may not always be so relevant. What is relevant is looking at the total amount of revenue the mining sector as a whole is bringing in. And that's what's pictured in this chart here. So uh, we actually did, despite hash price and hash value ticking down, experience a new all-time high in terms of the total amount of daily mining revenue. On March 11th, uh, it hit 79.7 million. 76.71 uh, million of that was the block reward, obviously boosted by Bitcoin's price gains. Transaction fees, uh, while they're not as high as they were, you know, through last year, are still remaining pretty elevated, uh, around two to three million per day in transaction fees. So obviously, that's going to be a major component of, you know, the narrative and the story for miners going forward as well, is their ability to bring in transaction fee revenue. As we'll, dis as we'll discuss, uh, you know, many miners are taking kind of different ways of looking at this, whether through offering value added services or, you know, even manipulating the blockchain in clever ways to earn a little bit more transaction fee revenue. But, you know, the big picture here is the mining ecosystem, while, uh, you know, rewards per terahash per second are dropping, it is bringing in more revenue overall, at least in US dollar terms. Yeah, this is the, the chart you lead with. If you're, you know, showing a presentation to investors, look at that. That's a great chart right there. It's like up to the right, growth. baby. Yeah. Up and down, <laughs> but then ultimately up and to the right. My observation is that so like the narrative it, this past year for mining was transaction, Bitcoin discovered a transaction fee market, um, but that is that still plays second fiddle to price. Bitcoin price drives minor revenue. I think and then my other you know, observation is having looked at being, you know, looking at taking analysis approaches to other commodities produ production industries, those are you know, especially at their international markets, they're very opaque to actually figure out and arrive at a precise number for overall industry revenue. But we have an actual precise, verifiable revenue number for this entire business. So that's a very interesting thing that, you know, we're entering into an era of more transparent and available data. Now we just have to figure out how to make sense of it. Absolutely right. And also a very liquid market. Not only do we have, you know, real-time visibility into the revenues, but Anywhere around the world, a miner can sell their Bitcoin, you know, liquidate it to pay their operating expenses. So I think that is kind of a unique differentiator as well. 
just one more moment on this chart as well. It's fascinating to look back at the fee structure over time. And you can see in 2017, fees obviously went crazy. There just was a lot of you know, movement on chain, obviously, at the moment. Then 2021, the first wick up to 69K, a lot of transaction fee issues. And then the second half of that year, when we had like the double bump back up to like same price. We did not really have that many transaction fees. And then going into this last year, Ordinals had two moments where we had a lot of transaction fees. I think it was like around April of last year and then later in the year in like October, November. Uh, and who knows what this year is going to bring, especially post happening, as uh, that ratio shrinks between the Coinbase reward and the potential amount for fees. So something to to keep in mind. I'm looking forward to seeing that chart change a lot more in the next few months. Oh, Bcash. I didn't know we were getting yeah. the Bcash. Let's go. Yeah, wanted wanted to make your head spin. So uh, a little <laughs> bit of a blast from the past. You know, I think a lot of people have forgotten about Bcash, but you know, there's been some talk, uh, you know, trying to bring some of the big blockers back into the fold, reconcile. Uh, Roger Ver is doing a little bit of a PR tour, you know, uh, bringing his new book, uh, discussion we get on the show? Wars. I mean that that could certainly be interesting. You might catch a little <laughs> bit of flack from the the hardcore laser eye maxis, but you know, always interesting to hear other opinions. So, yeah, and, I mean, we've had a lot of interesting opinions on this show. I think we've had we have decent amount of ETH people too. So he'll fill he'll fit in just right. And I mean, you know, his his bags are are pretty full right now. Uh, Bitcoin Cash has actually been on a pretty huge price run. Uh, maybe not relative to Bitcoin, but at least in dollar terms, um, you know, we've seen it go from, I want to say, under $100 all the way up to nearly 700 just in the past couple of days. I think it's uh, receding a little bit recently, down about 7% today, but still well above the $600, $600 threshold. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is the narrative around the halving. Um, Bitcoin Cash actually just had its halving last Thursday. So a lot of people are looking at this as, you know, a way to kind of front run Bitcoin's having take advantage of that whole narrative. And I will note, you know, up in the upper right corner here, you can see a, another pretty interesting chart, which shows Grayscale's Bitcoin Cash Trust. Um, actually, this trust is trading at a 300% premium to the net asset value right now. So not only is Bitcoin Cash running up, but people are actually paying a substantial amount extra to get exposure to Bitcoin Cash uh, through institutional, you know, equity traded markets. So a lot of people are playing this narrative right now. Um, you know, it, the price has been on a tear. And as you can see in this chart, that has also been good for mining revenue in the Bitcoin Cash space. Uh, it's nowhere near the tens of millions of dollars that the Bitcoin mining ecosystem brings in. But we have seen, uh, you know, the daily mining revenue tick up to around 200 to 300K over the past couple of months, and then even recently, nearly clocking uh, 750K up to a million dollars uh, per day in terms of mining revenue. So uh, that's kind of what's brought attention and interest back into this ecosystem is Bitcoin Cash price running up, anticipation of their having, and of course, mining revenue coming with it. Is there any more... This is not a mining question, so apologies to to everyone, but is there any other coins and these grayscale funds that are having like a crazy high uh this is not a discount premium right now yeah actually um so obviously the one that gets the most attention is the ethereum trust which is trading at uh quite a big discount right now i want to say around 20 percent. doesn't look so good for etf approval i think in may um but the chain link trust trading at a, around a 600 percent premium and then the Solana Trust looks like uh, around 400 or 500% premium. At one point, that Solana Trust, I think, clocked nearly 900% premium. So there are a lot of investors in institutional markets who are clamoring to get exposure to these assets. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily use that as a barometer for ETF approval for those assets necessarily, but certainly uh, a lot of people looking to get price exposure to those, and that is persisting. Yes, yeah, wild to see that continue. I guess that makes sense. If you're into trading, this is probably pretty obvious, but I'm not. So, okay. Anything else on this chart before I swap over to the next one? Uh, 
Nope, a few more Bitcoin Cash uh, charts here. So this one, you know, kind of just shows, uh, you know, more directly the impact of the halving. Um, you know, again, this happened last Thursday. So there were a lot of miners that were deploying hash rate into the ecosystem, starting with the price run up last year. Um, you know, hash rate was hovering around one to two exahash per second, uh, which is almost a comical number, which, you know, when you think about some of the publicly traded miners, they have 15, 20. Uh, I think Marathon has around, you know, 28 or 30 exahash per second deployed, whereas the entire Bitcoin Cash ecosystem has uh, on average around two or three. But uh, again, over the last summer, uh, we did see a big jump in hash rate deployed in this ecosystem, uh, started to climb up to three, four exahash per second. And in the last couple of weeks, we even saw it spike as high as seven or six exahash per second. Um, so, you know, a lot more people plug into this ecosystem. Obviously, that's a trivial thing to do, right? Like you can just kind of switch which pool you're pointing towards and mine Bitcoin Cash. So it's not like they have any real commitment to the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem by doing this. Um, but it is interesting to see, you know, just how large of an order of magnitude you could see hash rate come online to this ecosystem given it has the same hardware requirements as Bitcoin. Uh, of course, after the halving, we did see a big drop in hash rate as well. It's back down to the two to three exahash per second area, but still slightly higher than where it was before because Bitcoin cash prices remained elevated uh, at this time. Why do you think that no one's tried to like reorg Bitcoin cash just for fun? Uh, that's That's a good question. I mean, I guess, you know, it depends on what your incentives are and... You know, uh, one thing we'll we'll come up to in in the coming charts is we don't really know who a lot of these miners are. Um, you know, they're not necessarily the same set of miners as are in the publicly traded ecosystem. But yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I guess what is the financial benefit in doing that is questionable. I think miners do like to have a secondary asset they can kind of arbitrage and you know switch on and off their hash rate to earn a little bit extra money because um, you know. At equilibrium, mining Bitcoin Cash is approximately the same revenue as mining Bitcoin. It's just you're not getting as good of an asset in return. But it does give people a secondary option. But as to why they haven't tried to attack or reorg, I'm not totally sure. We did see a lot of that in the Bitcoin SV ecosystem, which obviously yeah. had much lower hash rate. Uh, maybe just the juice is not worth the squeeze because still to reorg, you got to turn on one or two exahash and 51% attack. And maybe that's not the best use of your money when Bitcoin mining is just so profitable right now. I feel like for the lulls, though, it's pretty funny. <laughs> that was, that's was that been my takeaway because I did some back of the napkin math with a friend. It looked like it was only a few hundred bucks an hour. You could reasonably, you know, time, what do you call it? Time warp attack or, or something like that, Bitcoin cash. And, um, but it's just too profitable to mine Bitcoin right now. And we got the halving. So why would you throw a wrench? Why would you, you know, throw a curveball in your operations with the halving coming up? Yeah. And, you know, maybe that is something to keep an eye out for is after the halving, probably a lot of machines that are currently mining Bitcoin are going to have nothing better to do. They're going to be latent. They're not going to be profitable. So at that point, just for the lulls, maybe 51% attack Bitcoin cash. Who knows? Uh, we, we could definitely see some fireworks trickle over after Bitcoin's halving. I think that line may be a great clip in three or four weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody with some ASICs, which aren't as profitable on BTC, could throw them over to BCH. We'll see. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely something to watch. A lot of these pools do have pool switchers built in. So, you know, Luxor does. Uh, there's probably a few other pools I'm not even thinking of where, you know, you can swap between different. That's to be the same uh, algo, but. Yeah. Nice yeah, hash okay. is one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, nice hash as well, which they just had their 10 year party. So, congrats to nice hash. Uh, let's go to the next chart. Yeah. Last one, kind of uh, related to the halving for Bitcoin Cash here, is, you know, obviously this volatility and hash rate does uh, result in some instability in the block time. So, you know, same as Bitcoin, the target block time is every 10 minutes for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, but with such a huge amount of hash rate falling off the network, we did see a pretty large increase in the mean block interval going from 10 minutes to an average of 13 minutes over the past couple of days. Not a huge increase, not super dramatic, but you know, for the few blocks following the halving, I was reading, you know, some people saying 
Uh, blocks were taking longer than usual, even on the order of several hours. Um, so this is actually, you know, the longest mean block interval we have seen for Bitcoin Cash since the initial fork off of Bitcoin. So, um, you know, again, that kind of does show that uh, having this amount of hash rate able to move in and out of your ecosystem can be pretty disruptive. Uh, they have done some things to kind of adjust for that. For example, instead of having a difficulty adjustment every 2016 blocks, they actually do it every single block. So they have managed to find ways of dealing with uh, the ability to kind of effortlessly enter and exit the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. But that doesn't mean they're immune to it, especially when you have a big event like a halving. Um, so one more on Bitcoin Cash, uh, kind of unrelated to the halving, but was doing some digging, just trying to understand who are the players in the Bitcoin Cash mining ecosystem. You know, with Bitcoin, it's pretty transparent. Uh, every single mining pool kind of stamps their block claims it, you know, you know how much Foundry has versus how much Ample has and so on and so forth. Um, and you do su see a few of the same players in the Bitcoin cash space. The largest known mining pool is actually via BTC, which, you know, comes in around three or four on the Bitcoin side of the mining pool landscape. Uh, then next is NiceHash, as we were kind of discussing. There's sort of a, a hash rate switcher. You can plug in a NiceHash and it will mine automatically whichever coin is most profitable. Uh, but kind of interesting, around half of the hash rate is essentially unaccounted for. We don't know who is actually mining these blocks. Um, so, you know, maybe that's good for Bitcoin Cash, uh, not necessarily having, you know, full transparency into who these people are. Uh, maybe that's a bad thing. I, I think it does indicate that it's probably a smaller set of actors uh, than you might want to expect as a participant in this ecosystem. But yeah, just a, a quick chart to show, you know, kind of the, the divergence between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash in terms of the mining pool ecosystem makeup. Uh, a lot of these miners are unknown. Uh, north of 50% don't kind of stamp their name on their blocks. So interesting to see some of the names on here. Um, and also it makes sense that they don't know or we don't know where everyone is at this point. Um, I think it just goes back to the nice the last slide where we talked about profit switching and some miners wanting to do that via BTC. I wonder why they're so, you know, so dominant with this uh, or so interested in it. I suppose it's not a large percentage of like their overall hash rate, but yeah. And then last one on Bitcoin cash here, I promise. Um, we did discuss last time kind of the growth of the Bitcoin blockchain size uh, as introduced by ordinals. So in the kind of uh, zigzag line here, you could see the daily megabytes added to the Bitcoin blockchain prior to the introduction of ordinals, around 200 megabytes per day. Uh, but almost immediately after ordinals and inscriptions were introduced, that jumped up substantially. Now it's around 400 megabytes per day. Uh, as a result, we have seen the rate of increase in the total Bitcoin blockchain size uh, you know, accelerate. We're currently around 563 gigabytes uh, in terms of block size to sync with the chain from Genesis. Uh, but we discussed that last time. I thought it was pretty interesting to just post this up next to Bitcoin Cash. Obviously, big blocks were the whole reason this fork happened. And Bitcoin Cash has a max block size, I believe, of around 32 megabytes versus you know Bitcoin's effective block cap of four megabytes. Uh, but Bitcoin's blockchain is still growing much more quickly, way more megabytes being added per day, uh, just because Bitcoin Cash can't really fill up these blocks despite having a, a bigger limit. So uh, almost a self-own in terms of forking off, you might say. I think this is, a, this is an underutilized uh, dunk chart for Bitcoiners. Um, and it's all, it brings, me, uh, brings up like, what is the, the Yogi Berra quote? Um, Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded Yep, for Bitcoin. So block space begets block space. We're better at being bigger blockers than they are, uh, and we're not even trying. <laughs> and uh, that's actually kind of the, the next point of discussion here, just looking at the trend of big blocks uh, over the last year or two. Um, so, you know, pretty similar chart, looking at the average block size on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, prior to ordinals and inscriptions, hovered around one megabyte uh, after ordinals and inscriptions. Now it's around 1.5 to 2 megabytes. Um, but of course, the maximum block size, the largest blocks, you know, kind of the outliers are extremely large up to around four megabytes. 
And we did see uh, in the very beginning, a lot of people really stuffing blocks. Um, of course, the infamous Taproot Wizards block, mined by Luxor, was one of the first. That's that first orange line there. Uh, these orange lines basically just represent uh, the top 10 largest blocks in Bitcoin history. So early on, we saw quite a few of these blocks. Uh, but then there was a period where there weren't as many extremely large blocks. Blocks were still bigger than usual, but people weren't filling them to the max necessarily. But since then, in the last couple of months, we've seen a resurgence in people competing for having the largest block ever. Um, so I want to say, you know, maybe six or seven out of the top 10 have been mined just since March. And of course, as we'll discuss in the next slide, a big contributor to that is some of the new services that are coming out like Marathon Slipstream. In the competitive world of Bitcoin mining, one name stands out, CleanSpark, America's Bitcoin miner. At CleanSpark, efficiency isn't just a goal, it's our standard. Our sophisticated facilities are built and led by expert teams who care about Bitcoin and the communities we work in. Scale, we've mastered it. Our large scale operations have set us apart in the industry as examples of community oriented building. Our track record speaks for itself. We navigate the complexities of the new economy with precision and with skill, continuously achieving operational milestones. Curious about how we do it? We invite you to discover the story behind CleanSpark's success at cleanspark.com. So I'll ask one of these questions on the next slide, but for this slide, I'm looking at between 25 to 50% increase in block size year over year. Is that a probably good estimate? Yeah, on average, of course. Okay. Again, the outliers can be much larger than before, but the average block size is, is still not that much larger, around 50% larger. Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. It's also interesting to look at when Tappert Wizards did their thing, and then there was two other instances, and then we had basically like a very quiet ordinal summer, all those people saying like ordinals is dead. And then it picked up again in November, but people still weren't touching like the large blocks until this year, where we saw some of these mining companies sort of get their new services together, whether that be a marathon or even like F2 pools doing stuff now. So that time yeah. span in between, I would not have predicted that. I would have, I would have thought there'd be a lot more of these completely full blocks. Um, so I wonder what that means for like predicting the future of like how full these blocks are. Yeah, maybe maybe Charlie can comment, but I, I'm wondering if this is partially due to the surge in BRC twenties, which are just text inscriptions, right? So they probably don't require as much block space. I think that became kind of the dominant trend halfway through the year after the introduction of, you know, sort of NFT style inscriptions early on in the ordinal cycle. Uh, but it seems like that kind of, you know, NFT inscription wave is, is starting, to, starting to make a small comeback here. But Charlie, would you agree with that being the possible explanation for this? Yep, that's been my interpretation in a nutshell is uh, it's uh, perhaps easier and uh, quicker to construct a block with fewer large transactions than a bunch of small ones. I mean, if you think about the like the logic that the block templates are constructed with, they're at least historically have been mirrored core. And while I've not done a deep dive on how the block templates are constructed, I don't imagine that the the way these pools and block producers construct the block templates has evolved for this like modern era of transaction activity. So I would like to see more innovation on that front. I think there's a lot of opportunity from pools. You see Mara dipping their toe into it, but I think this could go a lot further. Yeah, and we, we can dunk on Ocean all day, but of course that is one thing they do provide a lot more visibility into is their templating process. You can kind of select which template you want to use. So, um, you know, Stratum V2 hasn't really seen uh, too big of an adoption wave just yet, but at the very least would be nice to see some of these mining pools provide a little bit more insight into what's going into that templating process. Um, yeah. So speaking of templates here, yeah. my favorite, my favorite page on the report. Oh yeah, the the top ten biggest blocks, and you know, um, these are the same blocks that were shown in the last chart, but a little bit more info into what's actually going into these blocks and who mined them. Um, so of course, the introduction of Marathon Slipstream did make a pretty huge impact on these extra large blocks. As you can see, almost all of their blocks in the top ten 
were mined either in um, March or February. Uh, a variety of different, you know, types of content. We have uh, two runestone inscriptions. Um, we've got a 3D Game Boy type thing. I guess it's a gaming emulator. That's uh, block number seven, I believe. And then also we had uh, French Montana's Bag Curious uh, MP4 inscription exclusive song on the blockchain. You know, I like to say one man's blockchain is another man's lime wire. So, uh, you know, starting to see a lot more types of content coming in. Uh, also in the top 10, of course, is the Taproot Wizards block. Uh, we had a block shortly after the Taproot Wizards block from Terrapool that surpassed uh, the largest, uh, a handful from Foundry. And then most recently, um, F2 Pool actually mined the biggest block ever, surpassing Marathon. Charlie, uh, do you have any insight into what's the actual content of this block? Because I haven't done too much digging on it. It's another runes drop. It's an Asia-driven project um, that I don't have a lot of insight to. If you've got, I mean, it's one of those things like if you've got some of the notable ordinals or inscriptions collections, you got a derivation of this or kind of a delegation of this particular block. Um, I don't really know because the a lot of these, a lot of the activity for this type of stuff uh, takes place over on WeChat in Mandarin and then takes a week or two to get over to the West. I actually find the most interesting thing on this chart are the two foundry blocks. Um, yeah. Because those are very full blocks that are primarily um, comprised of inscriptions. That's right. And those are just naturally constructed just due to Foundry uh, running their, ran their, I assume, their standard block template construction and just picking optimal blocks. So I'm actually, I'm actually kind of curious. I haven't done a little look at <coughs> the, the delay or the time between blocks between each of those and their prior one. Perhaps uh, you had a long block period. Founder is able to accumulate a very optimal block template and then uh, put push that when they get the golden nonce. Just to jump in there, so for audience that might be a little confused, what we're looking at here is JPEGs smushed into Bitcoin blocks. Typically, Bitcoin blocks are just comprised of UTXOs, like transactions, Bitcoin moving back and forth. And it's pretty efficient. Like You can fit like what, what's a, a block like Upper limits like twenty five hundred transactions, somewhere around that, or and it kind of depends on like what you're kind of using. But that's normally the average I've I've seen. For these, like you can put in one JPEG, and that's all the data. Um, and then you know if you are a little bit more efficient with your JPEGs, maybe you can squeeze more in. Parker, do you know what the largest non JPEG Bitcoin block has been before the inscription debut in February, January of last year? That's a good question. Let me look back at the previous version of this chart before the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, I mean, most of them were mined in February of 2023. So I do imagine that the vast majority of those still contained inscriptions. You know, there was one by Brains Pool, one by Binance Pool, a couple by F2 Pool. Uh, but yeah, not totally sure what the largest one was. I do think it was still in the range of, you know, three megabytes plus. Um, but yeah, now at this point, you know, miners are kind of squeezing every last bit out of space. All of these are 3.98, 3.99 plus. Yeah. Um, and you wow. know, they're, they're big for the sake of being big. I mean, there's not really any reason that, you know, an image or an audio file has to be this big. Really what they're trying to do here is just purchase, you know, kind of advertising space and uh, reputation by being one of the biggest Bitcoin blocks in history. So it's almost become a billboard of sorts. I love that. Okay, next on to mining pools. Yeah, so uh, we touched a little bit on you know some of the unique things that mining pools are doing, but always just like to revisit the landscape and see who the dominant players are. Um, you know, last time we had this conversation, I think Ant Pool and Foundry were neck and neck in terms of dominance, um, but we've actually seen that flip a little bit. If we hop to the next slide, we'll see the current uh, dominance chart of mining pools. Uh, so, you know, again, I think last time we spoke, around 27% was going both to Foundry and Antpool. Uh, but Antpool's kind of, you know, gain on Foundry has since receded. Antpool currently controls around 22% of hash rate now. So we're starting to see those top two pools dip back below that 50% threshold, which is pretty nice to see. Um, where that hash rate is coming from that's coming online. I mean, Antpool, you know, the hash rate is not dropping off for them. It's just the relative share 
that's decreasing. But we're just starting to see more hash rate come online in some of these smaller pools. Um, you know, obviously Ocean being one, they're ticking along at around one exa hash per second right now. Um, I'm starting to see a lot more blocks coming in from Spider Pool as well as I think uh, SEC Pool. So you know, some smaller names beginning to break into the space. But overall, um, you know, nice to at least see the concentration in the top two pools drop down a little bit. Um, you know, there's always that risk of a coordination between the two, however unlikely. And, you know, it would be nice to see even the top three pools not control more than 50% of hash rate. This is still not a particularly pretty picture, uh, given the distribution of hash rate is well above 50% for the top two to three pools. And did you include in this slide deck the tweet from Mempool Space, by the way? Or should I pull that up? Because I do want to talk about like the payout addresses, which is a pretty interesting thing to riff on this chart you have here. So actually, that is the next couple of slides because nice. we did do a deep dive. It doesn't include the most recent Mempool Space tweet, but we can pull that up to provide some uh, more recent additional context. But a couple of weeks back, um, you know, started to take more of a look at not just the distribution of hash rate, but where those coins are actually going. Um, and, you know, we kind of hinted at this during the last conversation, uh, but there's for a while been some rumblings that the distribution of hash rate may not be what it seems to be on the surface. So the way we look at this is essentially the heuristic of zero hop addresses and one hop addresses. Zero hop addresses are any uh, on-chain address that receives a payout directly from the Coinbase issuance, right? So this is new Bitcoin coming into existence, uh, flowing from the Bitcoin protocol to the mining pools. Um, so that's the first hop. Obviously, it's a pretty similar picture to what we saw in the last chart in terms of hash rate distribution. The number of coins uh, going to Foundry and Antpool in 2023 exceeded 53% of all new issuance. So um, that's just kind of the first lens of looking at how new supply is coming to the ecosystem. Obviously, if you control a plurality of hash rate, you're going to receive the bulk of the mining rewards. Uh, where it starts to get more interesting, I think, is the next couple of slides. So uh, first thing you have to do is understand, is there any overlap between mining pools on that zero hop set? And there are a few instances where this happens. Uh, there will be blocks mined by both Binance pool and btc.com that pay out to the same address. Um, you know, these instances are pretty few and far between, uh, but we did see last year um, a handful of payouts going from btc.com stamped blocks into a Binance pool address. Um, and then later in September, we saw the same thing. Um, so, you know, the the explanation for this that I've heard from most people is that Binance pool mining software is essentially just white labeled btc.com software. Um, so potentially what happened is, you know, something got reset on Binance's pool, uh, Binance pool's end. And, you know, they reverted back to that old block signature of btc.com. But again, this does kind of show that, you know, there's more under the surface connecting these mining pools than you might assume just by looking at some of the top names on that top 10 list, right? So that's kind of the first instance where we're starting to see overlap between mining pools. But the next heuristic you can take a look at is one hop payouts. So one hop addresses are any address that has received an inflow exiting a mining pool and into a, a separate address. And, you know, you can kind of understand, you know, what's the number of miners uh, participating in these mining pools by taking a look at this. This particular chart uh, kind of takes a snapshot of all of the payouts from January 2023 to March of 2024. Uh, you can see Foundry, for example, has around 834 unique addresses that were receiving payouts. Um, and then uh, a variety of other payouts coming from some of the other pools. What really stands out to me here is that you have, uh, I want to say, seven out of the 10 mining pools paying out to a single address. This is that 3BH WGB address at the bottom. Um, around 18% of all the flows that don't go to exchanges go to this 3BH address. So um, this is a, a kind of a weird connection. Uh, you know, if there was a small amount of overlap, you might think, hey, maybe it's just a miner that's using multiple pools, but the sheer volume 
of flows going from multiple mining pools to this 3BH address suggests there's a little bit more connecting these mining pools under the surface than you might initially think. Can you speculate on that a little bit? What do you what do you mean by more under the surface? What would you say is an educated guess on what's happening here? Well, I mean, there there is a, a pretty clear explanation for it, actually. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is this first chart was basically looking at any address that's not an exchange. But if you start to pair this with some of our exchange clustering heuristics here at CoinMetrics, um, you can begin to see the flow of funds going from mining pools to uh, exchanges like Binance, Coinbase, and Kraken. One weird thing that popped up, however, was a extremely large amount of flows, uh, and in particular from Antpool, 50% of the flows were going to a cluster of addresses that were associated by um, multiple exchanges and service providers. Um, some of the names lumped in there were the exchange Mexi, which is based out of the Seychelles, and then Kobo.com, which is uh, a well-known institutional custodian. And uh, again, just like you saw with that 3BH address, uh, the majority of mining pools are sending their coins to this cluster of Kobo.com affiliated addresses. And even more interesting, it's not like they're just independently sending coins to this address. Uh, they're doing so in a collaborative manner. So on the right here, you see our top cross input transactions. Um, normally, when you see multiple inputs, from separate addresses, that implicates those addresses are controlled by a single entity who is orchestrating all of those addresses and joining those coins together. Uh, I don't know that's necessarily the case here, but at the very least, these mining pools, seven out of the top 10, including Antpool, BTC.com, Binance Pool, uh, and a variety of others, are participating in a collaborative transaction process to send their coins to Kobo.com and a variety of other exchanges, including Binance. Um, so you would think uh, based on this and including the fact that Kobo.com also participates in many of these transactions, Kobo.com is potentially playing an active role in consolidating mining pool addresses. Uh, you know, why are they doing this is kind of an open question. A lot of people think maybe all these mining pools are using Kobo.com as a custodian. Um, but one more slide after this, kind of my theory for this, is all of these mining pools are using Kobo.com's loop network. They kind of uh, brand this as an inter-business settlement network uh, for on-chain transfers. You can see some of the names on here line up with uh, some of the names that we have tagged. Kobo.com, Mexi, F2 Pool. So my speculation here is essentially a lot of mining pools have faced some difficulty managing full pay per share payouts. This is where you get rewarded based on the value of your hash rate, regardless of whether or not the mining pool actually finds a block. Uh, my theory is that all of these mining pools are essentially consolidating their liquidity together to offer full pay per share payouts. And uh, all of the mining pool payouts are going through Kobo.com at this point to kind of make sure uh, these mining pools have enough liquidity to compensate their miners. So major point of centralization and concentration, the fact that all the mining pools are funneling their payouts through this entity. Uh, but yeah, we'll open it up and see if you guys have any additional thoughts here. I want to give it first to Charlie, and I'm going to go back to the previous slide. And for those listening, this slide is titled Bitcoin Mining Pool Flows to Exchanges, and it shows issuance and fees going to different pools from Foundry all the way to Poolin, which I don't even know how they still have any flows. And then it goes from the different pools over to different custodians and or exchanges where these miners are likely liquidating their coins, perhaps just holding them on the exchange. But I'll hand it to Charlie. Yeah, I mean, we've seen uh, shenanigans in Bitcoin mining for as, you know, as long as it's existed. Um, I do wonder, like, is the incentive to participate in such a network like the Loop Network really that big to give up uh, block template construction or, you know, point your hash rate somewhere else? 
I do wonder what, uh, you know, the, the cons- why there's consolidation or appears to be consolidation. And um, then I also will make the comment that, you know, it doesn't appear that we actually have any transaction censorship, which is good. Um, but it does put us in a precarious position to have that at some point. I'm curious how the market and miners might react if that does become a thing. So just to put it in some different words, this whole scenario we're looking at saying, hey, we know all these pool flows for their coins go to this certain custodian. It's likely that this custodian has a relationship with Ant Pool. And that means that possibly all these pools have some sort of agreement with Ant Pool in place. And now it's like, what is the nature of that relationship that becomes questionable? And so for Charlie, you're digging into is Ant Pool causing these pools to do certain block template construction? Are they limiting transactions? Are they going to limit transactions in the future, whether that be like non standard transactions or that be like inscriptions or even like meta protocols or out of band things like uh, I think like was a core project now? Uh, we're seeing that in block templates or in op returns. We're seeing a lot of interesting stuff now pop up in uh, Bitcoin blocks if you look a bit closely, but we can't, you know. From the outside using public data, you can't really come to a conclusion on some of these things. You can you, you can raise speculation, uh, but certainly when we do see like there is some kind of uh, collaboration at the payout level, you do wonder like, well, where does this go and what's actually happening? So one thing you and I were chatting about with this, because this has obviously been on Twitter a little bit with the mempool tweet I mentioned earlier. Uh, they've been kind of like tracking these pool address outputs as well as coin metrics. And one thing we do know in mining is like there is oftentimes a relationship between larger pools like Ant Pool that have relationships with manufacturers like Bitmain. And there can be discounts for hardware if you choose to go with using a pool like Ant Pool. So I do wonder if there's some sort of relationship between, you know, uh, a Luxor or a F2 pool or some of these other pools that do have self mining operations. And they want to get Bitmain machines. And so it's like, sure, I'll direct a little bit of my hash rate your way. And then I get discounts on ASICs. Uh, I can't confirm that's the case for these, but I would speculate that there is something there. The only thing I wanted to bring up besides that is Marathon Pool. I'm not saying they're custodian on this chart or their liquidity provider, or whoever they're you know, moving coins through. Do you have any thoughts on that, Parker? Yeah, so this is uh, basically just showing flows that are going directly from the mining pools to exchanges. Uh, What Marathon tends to do is move their coins to a separate one-hop account. From there, they could be sending coins to exchanges, although we do know they have pretty big Bitcoin bags, so probably a lot of it is just going to cold storage. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, notably via BTC and Marathon pool, as well as obviously Foundry and SBI Crypto, are essentially the only pools that are not participating in this uh, cross input transaction scheme. And just to you know, shed a little bit more light on some of the things that are threading these mining pools together. I I agree. Ant Pool being affiliated with Bitmain and having direct access to the ASIC supply chain could be influencing this. You're also seeing uh, a lot of people point out that some of the transactions that are being accelerated by these pools. Um, are linking them together. So uh, in order to guarantee that a transaction acceleration actually works, you do have to have an extremely large amount of hash rate. You have to guarantee you're going to find a block, you know, kind of in the short term, uh, especially in incidences where, you know, that transaction acceleration is very time sensitive. So that's potentially one incentive is to earn a little bit of extra revenue through transaction acceleration. But yeah, essentially, you know, all of these mining pools are, you know, clearly coordinated together to some degree. Oh, uh, the one other thing I wanted to point out is these pools may not necessarily want to participate in this scheme, but it is sort of an existential crisis in some cases. Uh, For example, Brains Pool, uh, historically, they've not been a full pay per share pool, but uh, you saw a number of very large miners like Riot leave Brains for Foundry, which does offer full pay per share. So, you know, some of these mining pools are essentially being forced into the situation where it's do or die, uh, become a full pay per share pool, or all of your miners are going to leave. And so that might be a big part of the reason that they're choosing to 
kind of jack up with ant pool and consolidate that hash rate. Yeah, I suspect there's more happening with these smaller pools than people are aware of in terms of giving hash rate to larger pools just in order to maintain stability in terms of luck and then block withholding attacks and things of that nature. With brains especially, you know, it seemed like the luck was a big factor. I think they had like a, a month-long period last year where there was like they had really bad luck even though they still had around 5% of the network. And it, that can literally put a pool out of business. We've seen it happen before. Uh, interestingly enough, I thought Brain said they were going to transition pretty quickly away from working with Ant Pool. So I wonder when that will actually happen. It might take a little bit just to be able to get some feet with under you. Because I think like now they're more like a retail pool in a lot of sense where a lot of, or at least they branded themselves that way. I don't know if that's actually what their hash rate looks like behind the scene, but they've definitely branded that way. And if they're going to rely on retail, then they need like definitely a bull market pump to come in. Uh, they're probably going for institutional, I assume, like all pools are going for that. Mm -hmm. But to your point, like if you're a smaller pool, protect yourself. You got to shack up with with a larger pool. And and one other thing I'll add is, you know, for a lot of these pools, you know, the the pool business itself is kind of a loss leader. It's not their main source of revenue. So I think it's worth kind of staying alive in the pool space just to keep your name out there. A lot of them make their money on other services like hardware repair, you know, firmware. Um, so that might be part of the reason they're willing to just kind of give up the pool side of the business. Uh, you know, the block templating is not that lucrative for them. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point as well. Not to dwell on it for too long, but the fact that it's not, it's often a loss leader for a company and it's a very hard business to be in. We see these pools just struggle a lot or go out of business during bad times. Yeah, it's probably one of the most important things for Bitcoin and one of the worst points of Bitcoin's decentralization right now. Uh, and there's not a clear fix at the moment. Completely agree. Not the prettiest picture, like we said. So hopefully we we see some improvement there, um, especially with some of these pools being called out for their behavior. Uh, but moving on maybe to a rosier topic is taking a look at hardware distribution. Uh, maybe not rosy, depending on which model you're running. Uh, but with the halving coming up, obviously, your power cost is an increasingly important factor in maintaining a profitable mining operation. So one thing we're taking a look at is essentially what is a ASICs break-even power cost um, at current hash prices. So we see here the, the kind of lineup of some of the top ant miner models. Um, the S19 XP you know, can be profitable pretty much at any power rate at this point. Um, you know, the break even threshold is 21 cents per kilowatt hour, which is way higher than any reasonable miner might be paying. Um, S19, around 13 cents per kilowatt hour. That's around the retail electricity rate. So you could still be a home miner with an S19 uh, and operate, you know, just above break even. S17, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and S9, 5 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, you know, that's starting to venture into industrial rate ter territory. You essentially have to have you know access to commercial grade power rates in order to operate profitably with an S9 or S17. But you know the thing to keep in mind is with the having uh, essentially you're going to see this break even threshold for power costs also cut in half. So with the S19 XP, for example, um, it's going to drop down to 10 cents per kilowatt hour as your break even power cost threshold, which again means that a lot of mining producers who are paying for above retail rate in terms of their electricity costs are going to have to reconsider their mining operations. So just another metric we're keeping an eye on, just looking at the uh, break-even power cost threshold. Uh, it's really going to be a deciding factor in whether these machines remain online after the halving. But uh, a pretty exciting development in the hardware space is uh, the next iteration of CoinMetrics ASIC fingerprinting methodology. We did discuss this a bit last show, but uh, last year, the CoinMetrics team released a pretty groundbreaking report called The Signal and the Nonce. Essentially, this was the next iteration of Kareem Helmi's nonce fingerprinting methodology. Um, you know, the, the short explanation for this is the nonce, which is the number generated once, is a random variable that goes into the Bitcoin mining process. And you would think that each Bitcoin ASIC would have a somewhat random distribution of nonces since uh, the distribution of valid nonces accepted by the Bitcoin network is pretty random. Uh, but when you look at the hardware level, the distribution of nonces is actually not random. Each machine has a pretty distinctive fingerprint 
in terms of uh, certain bits they prefer to select in the mining process. Um, so you can see on the left, uh, our fingerprint in terms of the bit distribution within a nonce for a variety of different machines. Uh, we've successfully fingerprinted many of these and, you know, this report has been pretty well received in the industry. Uh, but wanted to kind of share with your audience today, we are in the final stages of integrating the S21, uh, the latest ant miner from Bitmain. Um, so this is, yeah, uh, an exciting new addition to our fingerprinting methodology, which is going to allow us to remain up to speed with the distribution of hardware on the Bitcoin ecosystem. So the most important kind of component to come out of this research is with the understanding that uh, different ASICs produce a different fingerprint on the network, we can kind of look at the nonce distribution on Bitcoin as a whole and determine what is the expected distribution of ASICs based on some of those patterns. So um, historically, this has been a pretty accurate way of fingerprinting how many S9s are on the network, how many S17s are on the network. And of course, most recently, um, with the addition of the S21, how many new machines are being deployed into the mining ecosystem. So uh, with the addition of the S21, currently we're clocking the hash rate share of the S21 around 2.93%. Uh, that represents, I, I want to say, around 90 to 100K units uh, in terms of you know, sheer hash rate volume, which kind of lines up with what you would expect. Um, you know, These machines started shipping just in the last couple months. Bitmain has said they would produce around 50K a month. So, um, you know, based on this fingerprinting methodology, we can kind of see some on-chain evidence of these machines being rolled out. So pretty exciting stuff. We do have a publicly available dashboard um, at labs.coinmetrics.io. You can uh, scan the QR code here or go to that website to check it out. The S21 is not yet completely integrated into this dashboard, but in the next couple of days, we should get that rolled out uh, and people will be able to take advantage of some of these new metrics. Congrats to the Coinmetrics team for getting that out. Uh, I don't know if probably next few slide. Oh yeah, next slide is electricity power. And I think that's the one big um, macro thing we can pull from this sort of analysis where we can fingerprint the network and then we can back, uh, back test that data to, to see what the energy pull is for the network. So I'll let you get into that. Uh, but certainly an important piece of analysis for understanding Bitcoin mining and its tie into energy grids. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one of the most important takeaways, especially for people that are not directly involved in the Bitcoin mining space, is understanding, you know, with real provable data, what's the electricity consumption of the Bitcoin network? Um, you know, past estimates of this have just been kind of roughly based on how many machines have been produced. Uh, but of course, there's a large margin of error when using those other methodologies because, uh, you know, you might be assuming there's a bunch of S9 still operating today, but the on-chain signals point to the fact that S9s make up less than 2% of the total hash rate. So by having a very granular uh, fingerprint for each machine, we can kind of determine the hardware composition and therefore the power consumption of the Bitcoin network. Uh, that being said, the power consumption of the Bitcoin network is very high and it is increasing quite quickly. Uh, in the last year, it's up around 66%. We're north of 20 gigawatts, which is a pretty staggering amount. Of course, you know, relative to worldwide electricity consumption and consumption by other very large industrial players, it's not that big. But the rate of increase over the last year is actually uh, pretty surprising. And of course, that is paired by an increase in Bitcoin price, bringing more miners online. Need ASIC help? Check out Vitamine, one of Bitmain's certified repair shops located in Washington State with satellite offices in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Texas. PSUs, hashboards, immersion setups, in and out of warranty repair, Vitamine has you covered. Want to train your technicians? Bring Vitamine to your site for hands-on training in the art of ASIC repair, complete with Bitmain AMTC certification. Contact Vitamine today at dan at vmasic.com. Again, that's dan at vmasic.com. When you think of ASIC repair, think Vitamine. Definitely. So the standard benchmark we see out there is the Cambridge one. I think you and I did a show kind of breaking down this one versus that one. The nice thing about this metric is it's uh, tied in a little bit more to the machines themselves. And so you get like a closer estimate to the network. I, I mean, I use it now instead of the Cambridge one, even though the Cambridge one is still pretty good. 
Uh, and then of course there's the DeFries one, which we I shouldn't even bring up on the show because it's so terrible. But I think the thing here to track is that 66% increase. And does that keep going up? Um, even with Bitcoin price at 66 right now, it's increasing. If Bitcoin price goes 100K or more, what does this chart look like in terms of power draw on the global network? Uh, for reference, 20 gigawatts is about a fourth, maybe a little less uh, than the entire Texas grid has uh, for generation. So it's interesting to see like when you compare it to uh, a state or a country, what Bitcoin is like. Now, at the same time, this is the same metric or comparison people use to deride Bitcoin mining. And of course, they don't talk about all the other things out there that use a ton of electricity. Uh, but the fact that you can do this with Bitcoin, in fact, you can do this with money is very interesting. Bitcoin is money. And the fact that you can see the cost of this money uh, in terms of electricity is, is pretty fascinating. Uh, that's my, my little monologue there. I'll hand it over to you again. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, not to knock the guys at Cambridge, they do very good work. And actually, uh, Coinmetrics data is a pretty important input for their methodology as well. Um, you know, we're still in the early stages of kind of exposing this data to the community. So I imagine you're going to see a lot more uh, hardware fingerprinting uh, derived from this methodology using Cambridge's estimates as well. Uh, but yeah, again, you know, historically, a lot of these estimates have been pretty faulty. They use Bitcoin price as an input, which is not really an accurate way of doing it. So by using, again, real on-chain data to fingerprint hardware, uh, we can come up with one of the best estimates in the industry. Um, you know, interesting point you make about the Texas grid. Uh, you know, Bitcoin does consume a lot of energy. And, you know, the, the framing of this used to be that this was a nuisance for power companies. But it has kind of reached the scale to where now it's almost complementary to the grid. And in our next slide, we kind of see an example of this. Um, you know, this is essentially taking a look at the ERCOT South Load Zone and some of the temperatures that that uh, region experienced over the last summer. Uh, there was a major heat wave and, you know, uh, temperature spiking to 90, 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, midday. And as a result, because of ERCOT's sort of dynamic power pricing model, you did see power rates go from, um, you know, very low levels to up to $1,000 per megawatt hour. Um, so this is just based on the fact that, uh, you know, ERCOT offers this dynamic pricing and, you know, People on the grid sort of respond to these price signals in real time. Uh, but at the bottom of the chart here, we basically show that, you know, at a rational shutdown threshold for mining profitability, you know, miners are always going to re remove their hash rate from the network uh, in times where power prices reach the sky high level. This is essentially a demonstration of riot strategy. You know, they're on the grid responding to real time price signals um, and they have many megawatts of capacity. But when those prices reach sky high levels like $1,000 per megawatt hour, Riot has a natural incentive to shut down their machines and free up that capacity on the grid. So again, I think this does kind of show the relationship between um, you know, power rates and uh, capacity on the grid and the natural built-in economic incentives of the Bitcoin network uh, are very complementary to one another. And I think you know, mining has gone from being a nuisance on the grid to being uh, a very important element of load balancing. There was a really cool chart that Pierre Rochard from Riot put up on Twitter the other day showing this exact same thing during the solar eclipse, uh, right. where I think it was like generation of solar assets obviously like dropped during the day precipitously. And so people who were like tied into solar generation started like curtailing loads or dropping off there uh, was my understanding of reading the tweet for about 20 seconds. So it's yeah. it's cool to see like the tie in between like the energy grid and Bitcoin mining. Like it always just kind of shocks me to see it. And I think this chart is beautiful, like the way you guys sort of put this together, not to like get super nerd sniped on this moment, but really, really fascinating chart. Um, cool. I'll jump over to the next slide. Awesome. Uh, so one more important output of the hardware fingerprinting methodology is our ability to actually estimate average network efficiency. Uh, of course, every machine has an efficiency rating in joules per terahash, the amount of energy consumed per terahash output. And it's hard to know where you sit relative to your competitors without having some sort of 
benchmark to compare to. But because we have this hardware fingerprinting methodology, we can estimate what is the average joules per tear hash rating of an ASIC on the network. Uh, as we can see here, right now, that's hovering around 30 to 31 joules per tear hash, uh, which sits somewhere in between the S19 and the S19XP in terms of efficiency. Um, you know, as some additional context, we've also plotted out the quoted fleet efficiency of several of the publicly traded miners. Uh, this was something we kind of checked in during our last conversation, but a few new updates. Number one, uh, network wide efficiency is kind of decreasing. Um, you know, there is, uh, an increase in the amount of energy consumed per terash right now, probably because Bitcoin price is increasing. Some older machines are coming back online. Uh, but still about as efficient as it's ever been in history. And then we can also see a number of the players have been hard at work upgrading their fleets to improve efficiency. Uh, some of the biggest gainers as of right now are Core Scientific, just emerged from bankruptcy. They've actually made uh, significant strides in improving the efficiency of their self-mining operations. And then also CleanSpark, um, you know, plugging away, continuing to improve their fleet efficiency actually now pretty much on par with Marathon, who has historically been the leader in terms of hardware efficiency. So uh, CleanSpark and Marathon now neck and neck in terms of how lean and mean their fleets are, which is pretty interesting to see. Yeah, one uh, comment on this from a mining angle that is like a little unfair in terms of the data is like miner efficiency for the hardware versus operational efficiency for the top of the line miner itself. And definitely like a divergence there. And I wonder if there's some sort of like there, there are a few metrics out there, like Bitcoin mine for exit hash, that sort of stuff. But it's, it's hard, it's easy to game those things. So, I'd be interested to see like some sort of all encapsulating metric for miner efficiency that can kind of show that the network is getting more efficient, not just on the hardware level, but that miners are becoming more efficient with like the inputs they use, uh, just on a business yeah. level, because there's so many inputs besides hardware. Uh, I know this metric itself is mostly talking about like energy costs and like how these machines are becoming more efficient. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of like a, a miner's angle. I'd be interested to see. Uh, I think there's another great chart from you guys um, just showing like the downward plunge in Jules per tear hash. I wonder where this gets to. Uh, the latest S21 Plus or S21 Pro or whatever it was they just announced from Bitmain, I think it was touted as 15 Jules per tear hash. Uh, now the S21 unit that first came out, I mean, I had the opportunity to go see it firsthand in December when it came out uh, or saw one when it was shipped over here and it didn't quite meet the metrics it was supposed to. It was like a little higher by like one or two joules per terash. Yeah. So obviously not that bad, like pretty high end machine. So it's good they hit something. Um, so I'm, I'm a little not quite sure. I believe the 15 joules per terash until I see it. That being said, they're the leader here and we'll see what MicroBT, Canaan, and some of these other newer manufacturers like Aradyne are able to do. Speaking of which, Aradyne just announced that they raised their Series B today for $80 million. So they are certainly uh, trying to jump into this game. Yeah. And another one uh, picture here actually on the chart is BitDeer, you know, uh, operated by former Bitmain founder and CEO Jian Wu. Um, you know, they're not exactly the most efficient in terms of their current fleet efficiency. But recently, they did announce they're manufacturing their own miner, the Seal Miner, which comes in around, I think, 18 joules per terahash. Uh, we still don't have a whole lot of hard specs on, you know, what's the actual power consumption and hash rate output. But it is interesting to see kind of the duopoly between what's miner and Bitmain potentially being broken up by some of these newer entrants, including the operators themselves like BitDeer. Yeah, well, BitDeer, ASIC. Interested to see that as well. ASIC games getting a lot more crowded than people thought it was going to be. I mean, it's still an 80-20 game right now, but there's more people coming. Okay, let's move over to public miners. Yeah, I think this is probably the last section in the deck here, but, um, you know, interesting to see CleanSpark's progress in terms of improved efficiency. And actually, there is some on-chain evidence that you can point to to directly observe this. Um if you take a look at essentially the flows going out from Foundry Pool to some of the top addresses, it is relatively easy to identify which publicly traded miners are controlling those addresses because many of them do release monthly production reports. So this address, for example, one of the top recipients of Foundry outflows, 3KM9AB, 
um, has monthly inflows that pretty much exactly match up with what Clean Spark is reporting. And so you can monitor their progress in real time. Actually, I think it was uh, just a week into March, around March 11th, I noticed that this dark orange pattern was starting to appear uh, in terms of the flows going to this address. And, you know, essentially darker orange in this chart means that there's a higher rate of Bitcoin coming into that wallet. Um, so it was pretty easy to call early on that CleanSpark was about to have a record month in terms of the total amount of Bitcoin they've mined. And this is despite the fact that Bitcoin revenue per uh, exahash per second, you know, hash value has continued to tick lower. So, um, you know, that was later confirmed just the other day, CleanSpark reported their monthly total for March, and that was 806 Bitcoin, which was a record, at least in recent history for CleanSpark. But I do think it is pretty interesting to see, you know, kind of the tie up between on-chain data, if you know where to look, can give you a lot of signal and to what's actually happening with some of these publicly traded miners and give you a little bit of an edge, including understanding whether maybe they've deployed some new machines, they've spun up some extra capacity, and they're earning rewards at a faster rate than usual, which is essentially what's displayed in this chart. Another great chart. Okay. If you're listening on audio, we're sorry, but uh, just kind of looking at production flows here. Okay. Publicly traded miners, market cap dominance. This is one that the uh, Mara pigs and others on Twitter love to discuss. So I, I'm glad we get to include it here at the tail end of the show. Yeah. And I, I don't know just yet what the, the clean spark cult is called. Maybe it's just that, but clean spark has certainly earned its place among the top three miners, uh, which they did not previously occupy for the longest time. Uh, actually, just this last month, they did flip Riot to become the number two largest publicly traded miner in terms of market capitalization after Marathon, which is, of course, the elephant in the room. Um, so year to date, CleanSpark has increased their market cap dominance from 12% to, I want to say, around 21, 22%. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see some of those operational improvements. They've been investing, you know, upgrading their fleets earning more Bitcoin uh, per joules per terahash, playing out in terms of their market valuation. Um, and of course, among the big three, which are Marathon, CleanSpark, and Riot, their relative share of the market is continuing to grow um, around 70% of sector capitalization, which is around $20 billion between most of the publicly traded miners, is allocated to those big three. Um, so, you know, it's, it's beginning to be harder and harder to compete for capital against some of these big names if you're a smaller publicly traded miner. So one thing I, I see on this uh, and is Core. So Core ZQ, they used to be you know, one of the largest miners and had one of the largest market caps and then went through Chapter 11 process. And you can kind of see at the end of 2023 here that their ticker drops off here. And now I believe they have like three or four tickers and they're all just like different instruments for them emerging from Chapter 11. Uh, I'd be interested to see maybe later this year, what their market cap dominance looks like if we could, could combine all these different tickers. I think it'd take a little bit of filing work because yep. there's like three or four of them. And I, I, full disclosure, I own a little bit of core, but I have no idea what is what and what is valuable. I should probably look into it. But there's like three or four tickers coming out of that chapter 11. Um, the Clean Spark Riot thing, we definitely covered on the show already, so I won't lend too much to that. I do have an on good authority that they're starting to be called the Riot Gorillas. Uh, and then oh, there's okay. the Mara Pigs. I don't know if the Riot Gorillas is going to stick. We'll see. Clean Spark, I am not aware of a name yet. So I've heard Sparkies, but there's not like really an animal for that. So I don't, I don't know. I kind of like the Mara Pig thing. And I'm still like, I don't know where the Mara Pig thing came from. Like what precipitated that? It's a good just, question. Yeah. But you, you drop one of these tickers in a tweet and they all just come flooding into your DM. So yeah, they're, right, we'll they're easy people to show. find. <clears throat> they really are. Excellent. Uh, they make uh, crypto Twitter a little bit more fun this cycle. So I think this might be the last chart of the show. Um, but, you know, one of the things we did in our previous conversation in December was kind of plot up Bitcoin price returns versus some of the dominant miners. Um, I think last year, Bitcoin had returned around 150%, whereas some of the miners were performing that, um, you know, outperforming by a substantial degree. 200%, 300%, and more. Um, so 2023, 
actually owning miners was a better bet than owning Bitcoin. And a good proxy for the overall sector performance is actually Valkyrie Funds, uh, We Gonna Make It, WGMI, Miner ETF. This holds a basket of mining stocks. And so you can kind of see the performance of uh, We Gonna Make It or WGMI in purple here. Uh, it bottomed out around $5 per share uh, in January 2023. But by the end of the year, it had increased substantially, uh, sitting around the $20 price level. So um, this outperformed Bitcoin by a good bit. We also have the relative ratio of uh, WGMI if you were to hold 100 shares versus owning Bitcoin. And you can see that through the course of 2023, that orange line is up and to the right. Essentially, miners are outperforming Bitcoin. But now we're starting to see a pretty interesting divergence. Um, now, while WGMI is kind of holding steady, you know, not losing too much market capitalization. You know, miners are kind of plodding along, trending sideways. Uh, Bitcoin price during this time, uh, year to date, has greatly outperformed uh, holding a basket of mining stocks. So you can see the ratio of uh, WGMI positions against Bitcoin dropping pretty substantially. So while 2023 was a, a great year to own Bitcoin mining stocks, uh, maybe some folks are starting to get a little bit jittery ahead of the halving, and those stocks are starting to trail Bitcoin's price performance on a relative basis. So an interesting trend reversal, to say the least. Yeah, I've seen a few people. I, uh, I've seen a few people talking about mining stocks right now not performing as well uh, over the last little bit. I think we talked about that with Brandon Bailey about a month ago at this point and why mining stocks aren't doing as well. So. We shall see. It's probably some halving stuff. Obviously, the diversification play or different options, I should say, for getting exposure to Bitcoin is now there. And those ETFs are pretty mature. I mean, just the flows into these ETFs has been incredible. So uh, there's maybe that thesis is playing out, right? Where initially it seemed like all the boats were rising with the ETFs coming out. But long term, maybe mining stocks aren't as great of a play. Uh, Brandon did a good job of articulating that in that podcast. So. If you're listening to this and interested in mining stocks, I highly suggest you scroll back on Spotify or Apple and take a listen to that. Okay, I think that gets us out of the woods. I'll give you the last few seconds here. Where can people find out more about you, Coinmetrics? Uh, I'll include include a link to the full report, obviously, in today's show notes. Yeah, so Coinmetrics, as I mentioned, you can find all the good stuff we're doing, including our mining research at coinmetrics.io slash insights. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our various newsletters, Stay of the Network, which is more of a deep dive format, and then Stay of the Market, which I write every Thursday, more of a market summary. Um, for me personally, you can follow me on Twitter, not calling it X, at Parker Merritt. Um, <laughs> I put out a lot of content there as well, you know, your your tidbits of mining alpha. So feel free to give me a follow and connect with me. Always happy to chat mining with anybody who wants to hop in the DM. So uh, appreciate the time uh, shilling the, the coin matrix platform here. Well, of course, uh, it's a mutual pleasure. Love working with the coin metrics team. I think I've told you this on the show before, but coin metrics newsletter is probably one of the oldest resources I've used in this space uh, going back like, years now. And so I highly suggest it to everyone who comes across it and who has not come across it. Uh, Parker, thanks for joining the show. We'll see you again here soon. Uh, ahead of the happening, definitely go check out the coin metrics data. We will have the link to the written version of this uh, in the show notes, and we'll put out some clips for this as well. Thank you to Damien Somerset, the producer for the show, and thank you to Nick Gates as well. If you are interested in learning more about the show or catch up with either of us, you can go to hello at blockspace.media. Okay, we'll see you guys next week.